Hello everyone, I'm Rachel Lowe from Physiopedia and today I am delighted to be chatting to Denise Watson. Hello Denise, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you Rachel. Thanks so much for uh, joining me. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to you about Clubfoot. Um, you work with children with Clubfoot in London at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing all about your clinic and some of the things that um, you particularly specialise in. I know you work a lot with the all of the children in the clinic and families and carers and things, but also with children with atypical clubfoot and, and some that may require a different sort of approach to, to management. So I'm looking forward to talking to you about all of that. But perhaps could you, for people that haven't met you before, just um, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are and what you get up to? Well, um, my name is Denise Watson and I'm an extended scope paediatric orthopaedic physiotherapist. So I work with a fantastic team at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital. Uh, we have two orthopaedic consultants, Alison Hume and Stuart Evans, who lead the team. And then they have a team of extended scope practitioners who um, work in specialist areas to support their work. And I, so therefore I lead the Clubfoot service at Chelsea and Westminster and some do other complex deformity work. Um, so as I say, I'm an extended scope physio. So I, I work as a physio, but I have additional abilities to do scans, x-rays, blood tests. I see patients from initial consultation and actually make diagnoses for the patients. Um, so I have a fantastic team of physios that work with me. And so I have two physios that work alongside me in some of the clinics and a physio assistant and a specialist nurse. And we're very much see ourselves as a seamless team. So we don't assign a patient to one consultant or one physio. We actually all work together so that we can provide the sort of the most timely care for the patients. So uh, if a patient's waiting for a tenotomy, they're not waiting for one consultant to be ready. They're the either of the consultants can do that process and similarly if I'm on holiday, either of the other physiotherapists can do the work and vice versa. Uh, it's very nice multidisciplinary team working that we have and I'm very lucky to work with such a proactive team. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds really nice and, and I know your team, I know you've won awards previously in the UK for your clinic and things so I'm just interested to understand a little bit more about how the clinic works. So um, how often do you run the clinic, first of all? So I have... Uh, several clinics a week. So I have a baby casting clinic, uh, a old, an older children casting clinic where I work very closely with our orthotist uh, and the consultants. And then I'll do two follow-up clinics a week. And one of the other physiotherapists will also do a follow-up clinic and will also have a tenotomy clinic. So I guess between us, that's six club foot clinics in a week because we see about 120 new babies with club foot every year through our center okay so 120 new um babies each year is that is that like a normal level is that a high level for a clinic what's that that's a high that's a that's a high level for the uk but probably a low level for somewhere like uh india or ethiopia or bangladesh yeah okay um good to know and how do the children how do they get referred to you so most of the children come through, they all have to have a GP referral. Um, some of the children come to see us from their local treating clinician who wants a second opinion. Some of them come as first treatments uh, because they live in our local area. That's actually quite a small number. Quite a lot source us uh, from chat rooms and online forums where they've compared notes with other parents and then ask for a referral. Uh, and some come directly from consultants that maybe recognise that it's a foot that, that would be um, a more difficult foot to treat, for example. Okay. So they come from all over the country to you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and how does that work when, uh, I'm guessing that you have to see the child quite often? Uh, it's amazing how uh, dedicated uh, parents will be if they really if they recognise that their child is getting good treatment. And I think for a lot of our families that travel long distances, a lot of them have had quite a sort of 
a, a difficult route into uh, treatment before they've come to see us and so they therefore are prepared to travel to get to us um, and we have to be a little bit accommodating on timing due to transport issues but um, yeah it's it's really dedicated families and uh, so I've, I've you know I've talked to other people about um, adherence and things with children coming to clinics and, and sort of distance from the clinic and transportation has, has been an issue particularly in the less resource settings is that a problem for you at all? I don't think it is in quite the same way. There are always families that find it difficult to travel. I think, um, I think I'm probably quite scary, so they probably want to come and see me. <laughs> okay, that's a good way to combat adherence issues. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so different to a low resource setting, which you know is to be expected. I. Um, I would imagine. So you've talked about, so you have six clinics a week and you've talked about the different um, um, sort of members of the team. You've got the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the surgeons and the physiotherapists and physiotherapy assistant, I test my memory now, and you also work with the orthotists and prosthetists. Could yeah. you just, is there anyone else on the team that we've not oh, mentioned? We have, we have an orthopedic nurse as well. That's right, okay. Would you just, would you mind just running through what their sort of roles are on the team? Okay, so um, all of the initial consultations will be done either by myself or the two physiotherapists that work with me. Um, the the, the uh, initial referrals will come through to myself and I'll triage them and make sure that uh, the most appropriate person is seeing them. So I would tend to see the slightly more complex patients and um, and the slightly more straightforward patients would be seen by the by the less slightly less experienced team. Um, if there are patients that look as if they've had quite a com complicated surgical history before they come to us, then maybe I would put that into a joint clinic with one of the consultants. So I do once a month, each of the consultants, I do a joint clinic with them and I will set that up so that we're seeing either patients that I think might require something like tib and tendon transfer or they might be patients who've had quite a complicated surgical history before they've come to us. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, with the physios and the orthopaedic consultants. Um, yes. uh, what are the roles of the other members of the team? So the uh, physiotherapy assistant and the uh, orthopaedic nurse really help with the running of the clinic. They remove casts, they set the rooms up, they order the equipment and get it all in. They assist with the tenotomies in, in that they'll prep the room and do, uh, do a lot of the preparation. And they help with some of the sort of organisational parts of the clinic. And then the orthotist, we have an orthotist who comes once a week to our hospital and he and I work alongside each other very closely looking at uh, solutions to children who have uh, recurrence in club foot or uh, a lot of the syndromic children who require um, more than the, the straightforward Ponsetti bracing and need, need adjustments to footwear or splintage during the daytime yeah okay and so just this might be a silly question from me but who does the casting and who prescribes the braces so the casting is done the casting and the manipulation all th three of the physiotherapists so myself and the other two physiotherapists all do both casting and manipulation and we deliberately um, change round so that we all remain skilled in those areas. I think that the casting is often underestimated as being a very simple part of the Ponsetti treatment and actually really precise casting can make such a massive difference, especially if you're treating atypical cases or cases where the child's uh, got a, 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 a difficult shaped leg. Uh, so the three physiotherapists do the casting, uh, the consultants do tenotomies and will hold for the last tenotomy cast, but really don't do very much of the casting otherwise. And then the physio assistant and the orthopaedic nurse can cast, but they wouldn't be manipulating. Yeah, okay. And, and, and that casting, you are obviously highly trained in that um, intervention for the children. Um, how, how would you advise for people that are running club foot clinics around the world and, you know, it's difficult to get the training, that sort of thing, how would you advise them to make sure that they're providing the best interventions that they can? 
I think there are a lot of ways of practicing that don't involve doing that on a baby. There's, the rubber foot models are really useful in terms of honing your casting skills. Manipulation, the again, the plastic foot model that's articulated is using that, moving your hands on that, studying that is really, really useful. And taking time when you're with each individual baby so that you're really thinking about the anatomy that's what's going on under the surface so thinking about the bony anatomy underneath the surface of the foot as you manipulate it and not just looking at the top of the foot and and, and thinking it might look a bit better if you move it such and such a way okay but it's important I guess before you start practicing or before you do those practice it's important to get the sort of face-to-face -face practical skills training isn't it Yes, definitely. And also to have the underlying knowledge. So the two things go hand in hand and, and reinforcing those and having a good mentor really helps. And I certainly know for myself, I couldn't have done this without my mentor, who was Naomi Davis in Manchester. Um, she really um, supported me through my initial learning stages of, of learning Ponsetti treatment, which was uh, 15 years ago. Great. So um, it's really good to hear how your clinic operates and some of the advice you have for other people working with children um, with clubfoot. Now, you've already mentioned that you uh, specialise in sort of complex um, individual, complex cases and sort of atypical uh, situations. Could you just, do you want to just talk us through a little bit about that? Who you, what sort of atypical situations you see and, and what, how you manage those? Okay, so the atypical feat is something that I think I've developed a real interest in, partly because I think I created some atypical feet at the beginning of my Ponsetti career. Um, and it, that's really what drove me to, I actually went out to visit Professor Ponsetti on the back of treating a foot I couldn't work out what I was doing wrong with. So um, what tends to happen is that those feet come to me from other centers and I'll now tend to be contacted either by the families because they realize they've been on an online forum with other parents and realize that that maybe they've had more than 15 casts and actually that's not the norm and some of them have slipped off and they're not sure why that's happening so I'll be contacted directly through the parents and then they get a GP referral or ask their local team to refer into our service or they or what's happening more and more now is that the physiotherapists or consultants from other areas will contact Chelsea, us at Chelsea and Westminster if they've got a foot that they recognise they're not uh, progressing with or they've done more than, say, eight casts. And they'll actually contact us and ask us to take on treatment, move the child forward, and then hopefully we can then send them back to that service once we've corrected the foot and got the, the child settled into their foot abduction brace. So how do you recognise when it's all going wrong? So with an atypical club foot, there are features which um, I think you cover quite well in your course content. So you've got, you've not, typically you've got a, uh, a history of cast slips. You've got uh, the foot swollen, the big toe is, uh, is short and uh, hyperextended. Um, there's a cross foot cavus. So there's, there's a crease right the way across the sole of the foot. And the child's become very irritable very irritable about casting they might have some tibial bowing you know it's just it's become all a bit of a nightmare with casting cast slipping off and the child being very unhappy and at that point um that's when we would like to get hold of the baby and give them a bit of a cast holiday before we start to treat them okay so start with a cast holiday um perhaps if that's appropriate and then yeah. and then what are the sort of typical approaches to managing these situations okay so the, the point of the cast holiday is to let any swelling resolve let the foot almost relapse a little bit so that it goes back more towards the initial presenting position and then you can start your treatment again and just tweak your treatment so that you don't end up having the same problems with cast slips um, so do you want me to talk a little bit about how i would yes do treatment yeah. So so once the child's foot is not swollen and then and it's not tender on palpation. So if the, I tell the parents to do lots of massage on the foot when during the cast holiday so that the baby's really used to having the foot out and touched and handled. And then we will start again with the manipulations. So 
we'd usually start with the normal first first uh, manipulation, the cavus correction. That's really important because, of course, cavus is a is a really strong part of the atypical presentation. These feet tend to be less tight medially, so once you go onto the second cast, uh, they're probably going to abduct more quickly than the usual idiopathic foot. So uh, we would abduct only until we could hit, feel the anterior process of the calcaneus coming out from underneath the talus. And as soon as I feel that, we're not going to abduct anymore. Very, very important with these feet to look at the sole of the foot and uh, make sure that you're assessing the uh, plantar crease and watching how that's, how that's starting to come out and looking at the uh, contour of the sole of the foot to make sure you're not getting a lateral crease appearing because you're abducting the foot too much. So it's real vigilance. Uh, the casts have to be super snug, so they have to be more snug than you would make your normal idiopathic cast, I think, um, with real attention to detail with molding around uh, above the heel. Remember, never touch the heel. Uh, so molding above the heel and making sure that uh, you're getting your knee bent to at least 100 degrees and coming really high up into the groin with the with the cast as you get it on. Okay. Um, so that is there any so you pay paying a lot of attention to how you're casting with these atypical presentations. Yeah. Anything else? In particular, is there any difference in the bracing or anything else that you do? So the other thing that I will sometimes do with the atypical feet is I'll cast them more than once a week. So because I have several clinics running during the week, I have the opportunity to cast them on a Monday, then a Thursday, then a Monday, then a Thursday. And that can just help with cast slips. If it's a big, heavy cast, you're making sure that the that that any swelling that has been there hasn't resulted and the cast slips off. So you're, you're, you're just able to move things forward a bit quicker for the parents. And even if they're traveling long distances, I think they tend to prefer to have a quick, short, sharp blast, especially if they've had lots of casting before. It sort of moves things forward. And then we're ready to do tenotomy as soon as we get the foot into the position where it's ready for tenotomy, i.e. Uh, the heels in neutral has come out of varus and is, is in neutral. The uh, lateral head of the talus is covered and the anterior process of the calcaneus has come out from under the talus and you've got a uh, resolution of that plantar crease. As soon as that happens, we're ready to move to tenotomy as quickly as possible. And that's not different in a in a sort of normal, straightforward case to an atypical case. It just might be the route to get there. Is that right? The route to get there and the manipulation is slightly different. You do a slightly different manipulation to make sure that you can get uh, the cavus to come out, where you uh, sort of milk the forefoot forward. Um, you're not actually forcing dorsiflexion, but you're 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 milking milking out the forefoot and stretching the, stretching the cavus. Okay, and then once the tenotomy has taken place, is the is the management kind of follow a similar pathway to the normal management, or is there anything else that you need to pay attention to with the atypical cases? Well, I think the management is is quite similar. So off, except that you won't set the foot abduction brace out to 60 degrees. Um, the foot just isn't ready. You don't want to take it out that far because, again, you'll over abduct the mid part of the foot. So I would set the foot abduction brace more like uh, 10 deg uh, 30 degrees to start with and then maybe start to bring it out 30 to 40 degrees to start with and then I will watch that foot as, as I do follow-up uh, follow visits, future follow-up visits, just to uh, make sure that we're not over-abducting, but I'll abduct slowly out if I need to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's They're all a bit trickier in the foot abduction brace to start with. That is the thing I would say, that the families need a lot of support here because you quite often, it's a small, fat foot and it's quite difficult to maneuver into the brace and and I, I, I'd say that from all the braces I've had experience with um, um, both here and in Bangladesh I think it's 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 they're tricky feet for for any braces yeah okay okay so that's a good summary of or good to talk through those the management of the atypical case um, 
Before I ask you my next question, I'm going to ask you about rehab, um, but um, is there anything else about atypical cases that you'd like to mention at this point? I think that they take some practice and, you know, if once we get the atypical feet and we give them a cast, um, cast holiday, they still don't take more than four casts to get them corrected pre So that I think it's a bit of a myth that atypical feet take a lot more casts. And that's certainly not our experience in our in our sort of homegrown feet. So the feet that we that present to us from the beginning, I always note on our Pirani scoring sheet whether they've got any atypical features. So if they've got a crossfoot cavus or they've got the hyperextending big toe, I'll always note that. And actually none of our homegrown feet, I looked at our 2016, all of our 2016 babies, and three of them presented with atypical features. They didn't go on to create any further problems for us because we recognised them at the get-go and were able to adjust our manipulation as we went along. So they're not, I don't see them as troublesome feet. I just see them as feet that need to be treated slightly differently. Yes. In, their manipulation, in that manipulation, in not, in not too much abduction. So I guess it's the most important thing is to recognise when it's going wrong. Yes, yes. And look at the casting, check whether the casting technique is what's letting you down, check whether the manipulation technique is what's letting you down. I, you know, as I say, I, I definitely created some atypical feet in the early stages. Um, and I think that that has made me really want to make sure that I don't do that again. Mm, okay. Okay, that's all very good. Now, <clears throat> as I talk to you, I'm thinking um, about after all the casts come off and the braces come off and things, and I'm I'm not an expert in this area, but I don't have any knowledge in this area. So I'm just wondering about rehabilitation. That I've never talked to anyone about that. What's What kind of process happens once all the casting and manipulation and braces has all been done? What What happens then? Well, in the vast majority of cases, very, very little, because children just get on with life, really. And and it's, it's not many children that I feel need physiotherapy to get them walking, running, jumping, playing. Um, try We try to encourage some activities rather than others. So as children get older, we try to stress lower impact sport hobbies. So... Uh, Rather than running, maybe they prefer to be cycling or swimming or uh, lots of them like martial arts. You get very, It's very good for their core and their balance. Um, but really, we try to let them be children as much as possible. And I'm not, I'm not a big instigator of s separate stretches for the children because I think if you get the feet well corrected and they're in their braces for, uh, for their 12-hour period overnight, then they shouldn't really need lots and lots of extra input that's good to hear the best outcome is for them to be going to school and nobody yeah. even know that they'd actually had club foot yeah okay so normal normal activities resume yes absolutely yeah good that i think when they do need some rehab is after tib and tendon transfer i think that's a time when um there's definitely need for strengthening rehabilitation probably some some um addressing their core symmetry so we'll do quite a lot of work on their core exercises to make sure that they they are more symmetrical because they might have walked quite asymmetrically for a little while um and the tib and tendon transfer definitely takes a while to to sort of start functioning at its full power. Um, I mean, sometimes up to you're still seeing improvement up to a year after the transfer, maybe a little longer than that. So I think there is there is some real scope for some rehab after tib and transfer, but not going in too hard and too heavy to start with. Mm, okay, okay. Is there anything? else that we haven't talked about in the overall management of a child with club foot that is pretty key, pretty important to discuss? I think it's education of the parents all the time and I think one of the things that I think we managed quite well in the clinics is that every member of the team knows to talk about that and we talk about it right. So quite a lot of my the families I meet I'll meet before the baby's actually born because they may have, they, they want to come for a prenatal appointment and talk about what the treatment's going to involve. And 
so we start right at that stage saying that the casting and manipulation phase is the correction phase really is our is 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 the hard part for us and the hard part for them is going to be the maintenance phase the boots and bars and the bracing and getting parents as much on board with that as possible i think education about the condition is is really key and trying to support parents throughout the process because it's not easy mm -hmm. So, so the team will educate whenever they have the opportunity with a parent. Is, are there any other techniques you use to um, um, help with the education, to promote the education? So we use other parents a lot. So, you know, we're very lucky in, in, because we have designated club foot clinics. We use maybe a parent who's doing really well with the bracing to support a parent that's not doing so well. Or, and I'm real, I love being able to show uh, a toddler that's running up and down the corridor to a new family who's just come in with their baby. It gives them real, uh, a real sense of achievement of what's going to be achieved for their baby. Um, we do direct them to, uh, there are steps have some lovely information steps uk has lovely information on their website um there are a lot of chat rooms and a lot of the families come back relating things that they've heard to on the chat rooms and we're very we're very happy to discuss any of that any of those issues with with our families i think just having an open inclusive um approach in the clinic holistic approach in the clinic is good yeah and i you know i really like the way that people talk about the um parent-to-parent -parent education, the sort of peer support groups that the parents can have. Uh, it's, it sounds like that happens all over the world and works very well. Yes, yes. I think those parent support workers, particularly in some of the projects I've seen in, in Africa, are they're, they're really key to the success of the project. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Um, I think we've talked about quite a lot there. I've certainly learned a lot from you talking to you today. Is there anything that uh, we haven't talked about that you'd particularly like to share? I don't think we've talked about uh, recurrence, have we? I think I've talked about longer term follow up and, um, and recurrence and um, how long we follow children up for. So we'll, um, we'll follow children up until they're in our in our center we've decided to follow up till 10 years of age um and we follow up quite closely when they very first stop the foot abduction brace uh because there is a risk of relapse and you know the quoted rates are somewhere between 15 and 25 percent aren't they that go on to require tibialis anterior tendon transfer so um we actually see the patients uh three months after they've stopped the foot abduction brace um, and then we'll follow either six monthly or yearly, depending on the presentation and what we're concerned about. Uh, and I think that discharging too early is a bit of a worry because there are children that will relapse a little later because of this inherent muscle imbalance that they have. Mm -hmm. So with the relapsing, what is it exactly that you're looking out for? So we're looking at uh, the foot position in standing. So we'll look particularly the heel position, whether the heel is in neutral or whether it's just drifting into varus, whether there's dynamic supination, which is where the front of the foot lifts up and in as, uh, as the child starts walking. So they strike onto the outside board of their foot slightly. And if that starts to happen, that has a knock-on effect on the heel position. And if that starts to happen, it also the heel tends to lift as well eventually. So we're looking, we're looking for those early signs of that. Mm -hmm. And when you first see those signs, what happens then? So I would, depending on the age of the child and um, how obviously it's presenting, at that point I might teach them some active um exercises for the everter muscle groups I might get them walking on their heels i might teach them theraband stretches there's no evidence that those make a difference but i think it's it's it helps the child think about focusing on getting that foot, the foot out a little bit and then i'll keep them on slightly closer review knowing that they may be a candidate for tibialis anterior tendon transfer if the foot is mobile i wouldn't do more casting uh before making a decision but if the foot is starts to become stiff then maybe we would consider some recasting but i think it's it's there's a balance too much recasting will mask the underlying problem and stop you treating it effectively um, not enough casting will make the foot stiff and then you won't get such a good 
result from Tiban transfer. So there's there's a balance to be had. Um, and what is the usual underlying problem that causes reoccurrence? So that's the most common problem for the older children who've done their foot abduction. This is the group that have, have worn their foot abduction brace until four or five and done very well and have recurrence after that. It's usually because there is an inherent muscle imbalance between the muscles that pull the foot up and in and the muscles that pull the foot up and out. Okay. And so that's when the tibialis anterior transfer becomes yeah. an option or what you would yeah. do. And that's different from the recurrence you see, can be different from the currents you see earlier, where the children aren't complying with foot abduction brace wear, and then they're getting at that early, early, early recurrence, which is where we would consider recasting and re-establishing foot abduction brace if possible. Okay, all very interesting. And so one last, so when do you make the decision to do the tibialis anterior transfer? So that would be made with the consultant orthopaedic surgeons, and we would it, we would be looking at the features of uh, of that dynamic relapse, and um, and if there's a if there is a, a, a stiffness or a structural part of the of the relapse, we'd look at recasting that to make sure we to really really importantly make sure we've got a corrected foot before going ahead with the Tiban transfer. And I think that's that's essential. There's no point doing a Tiband transfer on a foot that isn't corrected. It will maintain, but it won't correct. Mm, okay. Good. Okay. That's good. I'm glad you brought up reoccurrence and relapse. Um, I hadn't thought about asking you that, so it's good that we talked about that. Is there anything else on that topic that uh, you'd like to mention? I think it's um, there's there's a lot of question about timing for. Um, addressing that sort of relapse and the more that we see of children getting in earlier with tib and tendon transfer is better so waiting until the child's eight or nine is really quite late and it's it it, it seems to be better results going earlier um if you're seeing the signs that there is uh, a dynamic uh imbalance there so with the, what did you say, 15 to 25% recurrence rate? Um, yes. Is that right? It's variable in literature. And we think we think our rate for TIB antenna transfer is about 20% of Chelsea and Westminster. And that's in our children that we have treated, you know, right from the word go. Yeah, so in some ways that's quite high. And I guess that highlights the importance of the continuing um, contact with the child and the family Um um, with the not to discharge them too early and to have repeated yeah. leaks and to get them to come back in so that you can see them sort of three six months apart or whatever you know I mean for example discharging at five you are going to miss a, a significant number of children who who could potentially have relapse and then if they then take a long while to represent again so they're not then presenting. The par parents won't notice the subtle signs it's very unlikely so it's it, it's better to sort of just review them maybe once a year just until until you're really sure they're out of the woods and out of the woods we're saying is about 10 years old yeah I think a little bit earlier I think it's very unusual after seven to have a relapse if they're doing okay by by seven seven and a half it's unusual it's unusual for them to have a a, a relapse Okay, good. Denise, that's all been really valuable information. Um, so again, we've talked about a lot. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you'd like to share? Probably, but nothing that I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I think we've, uh, we've talked about a lot and we've talked um, and it's been very uh, sort of succinct and some really good information that you've given it, it, in this uh, short interview. You obviously... Um, have a lot to share and thank you so much for sharing that with everyone today. Um, Denise, is there maybe, any... Maybe the only other thing to say is I think that to to perform really good Ponsetti treatment, you do need a slight degree of... of uh, you have to be very, very precise. It's about being precise at each part of the treatment and uh, not just 
putting a cast on and thinking that'll do. It's got to be, every cast has got to be precise. The foot abduction brace wear has got to be precise. And the, the if you stick to the to the original, Ponsetti's original principles, it works. Yeah, I think that comes out, um, the precision that you need to have. And, and, and even as we've just talked about, so through the casting, through the bracing, and even in the follow-up afterwards, just the precision of checking that they're not relapsing in any way. Um, yes. So precision is a word that we should uh, keep in mind when we're working with children with clubfoot all the time. Yes, definitely. Okay, good. So, Denise, is there anywhere we can find out more about the work you do or the projects you're particularly involved in? I know I see, I've seen on, on Twitter your Twitter handle is Curvy Feet, which I really like. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not very good at Twitter, but... Um, Global Clubfoot Initiative. So I do a lot, a lot with Global Clubfoot Initiative and uh, the Africa Clubfoot Training Project. And I've also been involved with Walk for Life in Bangladesh, wonderful project in Bangladesh where they've treated thousands of children very successfully. Uh, and through Chelsea Children's Hospital, there is uh, stuff on our, on our website. Probably is not as much as I'd like there to be because I'm too busy treating patients to put much on there. But um, yeah, Chelsea Children's Hospital um, are, uh, do have a Twitter account as well. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, we'll share the links and uh, links to those things that you've mentioned there. Um, Denise, thanks so much for chatting to me today and for sharing yeah. your knowledge with everyone. It's really very valuable and we really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel.